So today's video is going to be another solved true crime case. Today we're going to Manchester, which is Northern England, rather close to me. And the case we're gonna talk about today is one of the most standout, shocking cases I've ever researched the whole time I've been doing this job. Due to like how random it was, the location of it, how public it was, how much this killer didn't care about getting caught, really. Not so much didn't care about getting caught, but there was a lot of risk for this killer carrying out this crime. Like they could have been caught at any minute, yet they still did it. It was just so savage and brutal. And what's shocking to me as well in the aftermath of this case is that there's no documentaries on it. There's no Netflix shows about this. And this is one of the most insane murders I've ever heard of. So today we are gonna be talking about the bus station murder of Shirley Leach. But before we get into it, I just want to thank our sponsors for today's video, Casetify. Casetify are a really cool phone case brand with military grade drop protection on their cases and they're actually cute, which is pretty much unheard of to have a really good sturdy case that isn't gonna break, plus it looks nice. <laughs> the military grade drop protection means that your phone is protected from drops of up to 6.6 .6 feet. Some of their cases are even almost 10 foot drop tested. So that means they've done the test, they've dropped it from all these different heights and the phones didn't smash when they were dropped in these cases. And I'm renowned for being the clumsy one of my group and I can firmly say that I've never smashed one of my phones when it's been in a case to five case. Like I said, it's hard to find cases with so much protection for your phone that aren't big and bulky and ugly, but case to five have so many different cases and designs, aesthetics, you can even customize your cases. Here are some of the ones that I've made before. I especially like customizing my cases because I'm unique, I'm not like other girls. When you customize your own cases, you can pick your own colorways and text and where the text is, you have so much freedom over what you can put on. I also have a few of their signature prints, which are also cute as hell. They have a bunch of collabs with big names like Coca-Cola, the Rolling Stones. Here's some of my favorite signature cases that I like putting on my phone. And Casetify are very kindly offering you guys 20% off of your order when you go through my link, which is in the description, casetify.com forward slash Eleanor. Thanks again to Case to Five for sponsoring this video and now let's get into it. But before we do, I just wanna give my usual disclaimer that I mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone that I talk about in this case. This video is for educational purposes and everything I'm about to say is just information that I have found on the internet and I'm compiling into one video. Just a warning before we get into this one, this case does involve themes of sexual assault and rape. So if that is something that you don't wanna watch, feel free to click out now. I'll be back again soon with another one that hopefully you can watch. So today's case takes place in Bury, which is a town in Greater Manchester in the north of England on January 7th, 1994. A local couple were just coming home from a night out. It was around 4am at this point and they decided to stop off at Bury Interchange, which was the town's bus station and use the toilets since they were the only public toilets that were really open at that time. So the man went into the men's toilets and the woman went into the the woman's toilets and when she walked in there was only one cubicle available because they block off all the others and just leave one for during the night. So this woman approached the only stall that was available but when she pushed open the door she discovered a horrifying scene. There was a woman's dead body lying on the floor of that cubicle. She was naked, covered in blood and seemingly mutilated. So this woman that just discovered this screamed, ran outside and called police immediately. When they arrived, the whole area was cordoned off and investigators began looking at the crime scene and the surrounding areas for any clues as to maybe who did this or who this victim was. The body seemed to be that of an elderly woman. However, like I said, it was mutilated so bad that even that was kind of hard to tell. It was a difficult crime scene to investigate because this was a tiny little dirty toilet cubicle. There wasn't much room in there for investigators to kind of walk in, get a 360 view of the body without actually touching or moving any kind of evidence that might be important. It took almost 14 hours for the victim to be identified, but finally police had a name. 
This woman was a Mrs. Shirley Leach. Shirley Leach was a 66 year old grandmother, born and raised in Bury. That was where she'd stayed all her life pretty much. She'd raised her kids there, she'd retired there. She was a widow after her husband passed away two years prior in 1992 from cancer. And these days she spent most of her time either with her children, her grandchildren or with her neighbors. She was, from what I could tell in my research, just a very kind, old lady, just a very loving, doting grandmother. Her grandchildren and her children were absolutely everything to her. She was she was very caring, very loving to everyone she met, her neighbors, friends. She would go around to the neighbor's house for tea and coffee a lot. They loved her, all the neighbors loved her. One of them even saying she was a lovely, kind person that would help anyone if she could. Shirley lived with her son, Gary. She actually had two children, both of which were adults now. Gary and a daughter named Beryl. Beryl had moved out, she had a family of her own, she actually had her own child, giving Shirley a grandchild, 19 year old Darren, who Shirley was actually very close with. The two of them, Shirley and Darren, shared a love of music and they always used to go to record shops together and talk about new artists. He said that Shirley even knew more about current artists than he did. She was very young for her age. Darren described Shirley as being more like a mother to him, like a second mother rather than a grandmother. They would go out and have a laugh together and go to the pub and you know, they would they just had a very close relationship. He recalled his grandmother being a very generous woman. She would always help him with finances here and there because this was a 19 year old boy. He doesn't exactly have you know, all of his finances laid out, he's not at the peak of his career. And she knew that and she would just give him a little bit of extra money here and there when he needed it. He didn't even have to ask for it. Darren's mother, Beryl, Shirley's daughter, was actually in hospital at the time of Shirley's murder. She'd been in hospital for just over a week at that point. I don't think it was anything serious. I think maybe it had just been an accident or something like that. But of course, this meant that 19 year old Darren was kind of looking after himself in his house for once. And so Shirley would help him out buying him groceries and stuff like that, just because she was a very generous woman. On the day of her murder, on January 6th, 1994, Shirley Leach had been out with her grandson, Darren. They'd first been to visit his mother, her daughter, Beryl, in Fairfield Hospital, and then on their way home, they decided to stop off at a pub. They only had one drink or maybe two, and then Shirley decided that it was probably time that she was going home. It was winter, it was getting dark outside, and it was getting rather late. It was pushing nine o'clock at this point, and she needed to get two buses home. So they both hopped on the same bus that headed to Bury Interchange, and Darren got off a couple of stops before Shirley, who would stay on it all the way to the interchange, and then get her second bus. So Darren says goodbye to his grandmother, gets off the bus, waves her off and watches the bus drive off. And that was the last time he ever saw his grandmother. Shirley arrived at Berry Interchange around 9, 10 p.m. that night and she was seen by multiple people. She was safe and well at this point. There were actually two nurses on her bus that got off at the same time as her that recognized her from the hospital. So they were able to confirm that to police that she got to the bus station safe, she was there safe. But then Shirley made her way to the bus stand that she would get her second bus from and she realized that she just missed it. And she'd never missed this bus before. She'd always made this connection every time she'd come home from the hospital. And what's worse, this was the first time she'd ever done that journey alone. Normally at this point for her second bus, she would be with another family member because they tended to go to the hospital in groups. So it just so happened that the first time she ever missed her connecting bus, she was also alone at night time. So anyway, she gets to the bus stand. She realizes that her next bus won't be there until around 9.40 p.m. So she had about 20, 30 minutes and she decides to go to the toilet while she waits. The toilets were on the opposite side of Berry Interchange and they were actually on the outside of the building. So the door to get in was outside rather than inside. So the likelihood of anyone seeing Shirley enter or leave the toilets was very low. She was spotted making her way across the interchange around 9.15 p.m. that night. She was spotted by one of the nurses that recognized her and within five minutes of that sighting, Shirley Leach would be brutally murdered. Her body was taken for an autopsy and it was found that despite all of the blood, there was a lot of blood at this crime scene her cause of death hadn't actually been from all of her wounds. It had actually been from strangulation. And it seemed that there'd actually been quite some time between her actual murder 
And the time that she was mutilated, they believe it was done, of course, after she was already dead and with a smashed glass bottle that was never found. One of her breasts was fully amputated and that too was never found. It wasn't left at the crime scene. They believe that the killer took it as some kind of trophy. There was that along with just a lot of other cuts and wounds in her whole body. Perhaps the killer was trying to make the body unidentifiable so that it couldn't possibly trail back to them. Say if the killer had bitten Shirley during this attack, then there would be a teeth imprint on her body and that could be checked against dental records and that would easily lead to a killer. And there was actually saliva found on Shirley's body. So it seemed that that was the most likely case. Maybe the killer remembered after the attack that they'd bitten Shirley and then returned to her body to mutilate her and possibly cut off her breast that they'd bitten. That saliva sample that was found on Shirley's body was DNA tested, but nothing was found. This was the early 1990s, so DNA testing wasn't very good. There was also a fingerprint taken from the crime scene, but same thing again, there were no match results on the database. And as I said, there was a lot of blood at this crime scene. However, when it was all tested, it seemed that there were two different blood samples. Of course, one of them a match to Shirley Leach, but then the other one didn't have a match. So it's believed that that was her killer's blood. Maybe Shirley had hit her attacker, been defending herself and you know, caused them to bleed all over the crime scene. That could be a potential huge lead in this. And it was also found in her autopsy that 66 year old Shirley had been raped as part of this ordeal. Police had thought that would be the case, some kind of sexual assault alongside the murder due to how her body was found, she was found naked, but the autopsy did confirm that. Some sources say that Shirley's dentures and her clothes were found on the floor of this toilet cubicle although I'm not 100% sure that that's accurate, so I thought it was worth mentioning, but again, not sure if it's true. The murder was theorised to have taken place between 9.15pm and 9.20pm that night, which, yes, it is late, but this was a bus station, an interchange as well, so it had a lot of people coming and going at no matter what hour it was. So police thought that surely someone in that bus station had to have seen something that night. Maybe someone following Shirley, hanging too close to her, someone hanging around the toilets maybe. So the original public appeals in this case really focused on getting witnesses that were at the station that night to come forward to police with any information they might have because there was no way of tracing everyone that was at the bus station that night. So they were just kind of hoping that someone might see the appeals and voluntarily come forward. A man named Gary O'Neill saw the news and got in contact with police because he too was just getting off of a bus at Berry Interchange around 9 p.m. that night, the same time as Shirley would have been. He said he was just walking in the direction of the toilets once he got off the bus. He wasn't going to the toilets, but like he was walking in that direction, he could see it. And there was a man standing outside of the toilets that night. And you know, on a normal day, this wouldn't have been suspicious. So he didn't really think much of it. However, now that he knew a murder had taken place inside the toilets, he wanted to come to police and kind of describe this man. He said he thought the man was either in his late 40s, early 50s. He was wearing a long light colored coat, maybe a flat cap and a green bag but that was all he could really tell police. Another female witness came forward to police saying that she was in Berry Interchange around 8.30 p.m. that night. So that's about 40 minutes before the murder would have taken place. And she said that she'd come across a very suspicious man. This man had approached her and he wouldn't leave her alone. He was asking her loads of questions. He asked her for a cigarette. He was kind of, I don't think he was flirting with her, but it was it was odd, it was uncomfortable for her and she didn't want to wait for her bus while this man was there. And so instead of waiting for a bus, she called a taxi. And if that was Shirley's killer that this woman was speaking to that night, maybe she was meant to be the killer's first victim and maybe her calling a taxi was what saved her life that night. This woman also described a very similar looking man to the first witness. So police were already feeling like they were on the right track. A group of teenagers came forward to police saying that they'd been hanging around Berry Interchange that night, not in the bus station, but like kind of down the road a little bit. But like I said, the toilets were on the outside of the building. So 
they would have seen or heard something if they were on the street. And they said that they'd actually heard a woman's scream coming from the toilets that day. They said they heard it, but they didn't think too much of it and they never saw anything. They weren't particularly looking for anything. So they just carried on talking. And although that of course wouldn't help police identify a suspect, it did help them narrow down the timeline of events. If that scream had been from Shirley Leach, then her murder was between 9.15 and 9.20, just like they'd theorised. Another elderly woman came forward to police and told them that she'd been waiting in a queue for a bus that day with her friend when they'd seen a man hanging about outside the woman's toilets. She never saw his face, he had her back turned to her the whole time, so she couldn't really tell police much. However, she did add on to the description of the other people by saying that she believed the man to be around five foot seven or five foot eight. But there was one particular sighting from a young girl at the bus station that night that police believed was their most promising lead yet. This girl had been queuing for her bus in one of the outside bus shelters around 10 past 10 that night. So that's almost an hour after they believe Shirley was murdered. And this girl said that she'd seen a man walking away from Berry Interchange that night holding a handkerchief soaked in blood. It was unclear whether this was his blood or Shirley's blood if this was the killer that this girl had seen because we know that both of them bled, of course. This timing lines up perfectly with probably when the killer would have gone back to mutilate Shirley, so perhaps it was Shirley's blood. But we also know that Shirley had defended herself and hit her attacker in the face, causing them to bleed too. So it could have also been him trying to patch up his wounds possibly. Because she did say that he was holding it to his face quite a lot of the time. Although of course she didn't pay too much attention to this man. However, all of these witness statements came together to produce one killer profile. They believed that this was a white man in his late forties to early fifties. He was between five foot seven and five foot eight. He seemed to dress well. He was wearing like a long coat and a flat cap. So perhaps that was just how he dressed normally. And that was pretty much all police really had. An EFIT sketch was made, a police sketch, which is where they get all the witnesses in and they ask them to describe the man in as best detail as they possibly can. And that sketch was put all over the news. Reconstructions were made of all of these sightings of this man, as well as reconstructions of Shirley's last known movements. And they were all aired on BBC's Crime Watch. And when they were aired, police did receive a lot of calls with a lot of potential leads. However, none of them really led to a suspect. They didn't give any substantial information in the case. All in all, 700 people were interviewed in this case be it, you know, witnesses, people that were in the bus station or that area that night, family and friends of Shirley. But police were coming to a dead end in this case. None of these interviews led anywhere. There were no new leads coming in. Police knew that they had to take a different approach if they wanted better results. So they decided to do a mass DNA screening of hundreds of men in the surrounding area of Berry Interchange. All of these men had to give both a fingerprint and a saliva sample so that they could be tested against the fingerprint and saliva sample found at the crime scene. Over 500 men were tested as part of this screening and not one match was found. Police theorised that Shirley was being watched as she headed to the toilet that night. It wasn't like her killer was already in the toilets. They think that he'd seen her as she was walking there and took the opportunity in a split second. They believe he followed her in to the toilets and followed her to the cubicle and before she could turn around and shut the door and lock it behind her, he attacked. There, the killer raped and strangled Shirley to death before leaving her there alone in that toilet cubicle for over half an hour and then returning with this smashed glass bottle to mutilate her body. Perhaps the killer was intending on leaving this as just a rape and murder. Maybe they weren't gonna mutilate her, but perhaps after they left and all of that adrenaline was leaving their body and they were thinking about what they just did, maybe that was when they remembered the bite mark. I say that like there was definitively a bite mark, we don't know because the body was mutilated and one of her breasts has never been found. That's just theorized to be the most likely reason for the mutilation and the fact that one of her body parts wasn't found again. Some people think that maybe he took the breast as a trophy. Others think that it was literally just to 
try to dispose of evidence. Or maybe the killer hadn't returned to the body to mutilate it because of evidence. Maybe this was just such a sick, twisted individual that they just didn't feel done yet and the killer wanted to return to the body and keep going. Despite all of police's efforts, this case very quickly went cold which was terrifying for the people of Bury because someone that was capable of doing this to a 66 year old woman and then going back to the body and mutilating it further, whoever had done that could easily do it again. In fact, someone as sick and twisted as the killer that carried this out probably would do it again because now they feel like they can get away with it. They feel like they're above the law and you know, they can just commit crimes like this without being caught. And that's all the more motivation for their horrendous mind to want to do this again. Berry was never quite the same after Shirley's murder. Women were terrified to go anywhere alone, especially the bus station, especially at night. Sales of protective accessories like rape alarms and stuff increased in that area by so much because everyone was just terrified that the killer was gonna strike again. A year later, around the anniversary of the murder the following January, police planned a stakeout mission at Berry Interchange, almost hoping the killer might come back as some sort of sick remembrance of their crime, but they didn't see anything. Years and years went by with no real developments in this case, although Shirley's family never stopped fighting. They were doing continuous appeals and always campaigning for Shirley's killer to be brought to justice. And in this time since the murder, Shirley's daughter Beryl had actually developed a form of mouth cancer, which her doctors believe was brought on or worsened from the stress of going through this, through the loss of her mother in such a horrific way. Through the investigation, of course, police had checked any and every CCTV camera they possibly could in that area. However, it was the 1990s, so both camera quality and the amount of cameras in areas wasn't very good. Having security cameras everywhere on pretty much every single building is actually quite a new thing. And back then they were only on like important buildings that had stuff to steal. So it was kind of hard for police because there were no cameras near the toilets so they couldn't see anyone go in or out. There were only cameras on certain parts of the bus station and of course they checked CCTV cameras from the surrounding areas to see if they could see anyone kind of walk towards the bus station and then walk away at specific times because then they could piece that together with the timeline. Say they saw a man walk towards the bus station just before 9 p.m and then leave again and then come back just before 10 because that had kind of fit with the timeline of the killer coming, murdering Shirley, leaving, and then coming back to mutilate her. And there was one man who was seen on a few different CCTV cameras in that area of around the bus station and he did vaguely match the suspect description. One of these cameras that this man was spotted on was at a local garage. One of them was of course Berry Interchange itself and then another one was another street kind of in another direction. And at one point on these cameras, this man is seen running which is rather suspicious. So a screenshot from the CCTV footage was taken and it was plastered all over the news with police saying if anyone can identify this man on the CCTV footage to come forward and give a name. This man was mostly bald. He had a ring of bushy hair around this kind of area of his head and he seemed to have one limp arm that kind of stayed by his side even when he was running and he was using the other arm. So police theorized that either this arm was injured or maybe it was, you know, Maybe this was more of a permanent medical condition that this man had that meant he couldn't move his arm. Luckily for police, you could actually see this man's face on the CCTV screenshots. And this led to a lot of people calling in and giving the same name over and over again, Peter Buchanan. And so Mr. Buchanan was brought in for questioning. He was asked where he was on the night of the murders and Mr. Buchanan said that he wasn't even in Bury that night. Although something interesting to note about this man was that he actually had a prosthetic arm that he couldn't move and it just 
laid limp at his side. He denied being the killer, although he did admit that the man on CCTV looked an awful lot like him. The hair was exactly the same, of course, the arm was exactly the same, his build, his height. It looked very suspicious. And for that reason, Peter Buchanan was asked to give a DNA sample so that his saliva and fingerprints and even blood could be tested against that found at the crime scene. But it wasn't a match. For that reason, Mr. Buchanan was ruled out as a suspect, although that didn't stop the reputation that he now had in Berry. He was bullied in the streets. He would have people drive past him and roll down their windows just to scream at him, just to call him a murderer. And this would continue for years until police finally had a breakthrough in this case that led to a new suspect being identified, not Mr. Buchanan. And this came as quite a surprise for police because they believed that Shirley's murderer had either died or moved away since they really expected him to strike again. But on the 18th of February, 2006, so 12 years after the murder took place, police found their killer, but in a very unexpected way. On this day, officers were out doing road checks in Moston in North Manchester when they saw one car driving particularly recklessly. So they pulled over the driver, suspecting him of drink driving, and they gave him a breathalyzer test which actually came back positive. This man was drunk. And so they brought him back to the police station. And one thing that police in the UK do is that everyone that comes into the police station on any kind of offence, they fingerprint them, they take DNA, just, you know, for any future crimes that they might commit, they've got all their information in the database. So these DNA samples were taken, the fingerprints, the saliva, and it was inputted into the DNA database. And when it was, it rang up as a match to the DNA found at the site of the murder. This man was Shirley Leach's killer. His name was Ian O'Callaghan. He was a former soldier, a former road cone manufacturer, and now a bus driver. He would have been 25 years old at the time of the murder, but now when he was caught 12 years later, he was 37. He couldn't give police an alibi as to where he was on the night of the murder, but you know, it, it was 12 years ago at this point and I'm not sure a lot of people would remember where they were 12 years ago on a specific day. Police kind of understood that they were just asking, you know, just cause it's part of the interview process, but that would have been insignificant compared to the amount of evidence that they now had against him, the DNA evidence. But not only that, police decided to search up Ian O'Callaghan's name in the database to see if he had any kind of criminal history. And he had a lot. Most of the crimes connected to O'Callaghan were sexual in nature, and this included rape, sexual assault, and indecent exposure. One of which was when he was just 16 years old. Ian O'Callaghan broke into the home of a 46 year old woman and raped her in her own home in the middle of the night. Other charges included one for punching a random woman in a bar. He didn't know this woman and he knocked her unconscious. Another one for exposing himself to three siblings, three female siblings, one of which was 19 years old, but the other two were much younger. At the time of Shirley's murder, Ian O'Callaghan was living around 25 minutes away from Berry Interchange. He was living with his wife, who was then his girlfriend, now his wife, and his child. Little did his family know that he was a callous, twisted murderer. Among other things too, like I said, he had multiple other convictions and allegations against him for years. He denied all involvement in Shirley Leach's murder, but the evidence against him was just way too strong. How was his saliva and blood at the scene of the murder? But if the DNA sample wasn't good enough, which it was, he also matched all of the witness descriptions that were given from the bus station that night. As soon as police got the DNA test results back that this was Ian O'Callaghan's blood and saliva at the scene, he was arrested on suspicion of the murder of Shirley Leach, 12 years after it happened. A trial commenced and O'Callaghan was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 28 years. But unfortunately, that is not quite the end of this case. Something else came out about Ian O'Callaghan in the years following that 
that gave him even more time in prison. A girl in her 20s had been searching online one day in the mid 2010s, so almost a decade after he'd actually been imprisoned for the murder, when she came across an article about Shirley Leach's murder and she saw the mugshot of Ian O'Callaghan and this mugshot brought back a lot of memories for this girl. She told police that this man, Ian O'Callaghan, had actually raped her over a decade ago when she was 11 years old and she'd kept it a secret this whole time because she was genuinely scared that this man would murder her. This attack happened in 2001, so after the murder of Shirley Leach. It's obvious that he, once he'd gotten away with that murder, he thought that he was above the law and he could get away with anything. She said that he was wearing his bus driver's uniform when it happened. He got her alone in a dark alleyway and said to her, let's see if you can keep this one secret. It wasn't until she saw that he was in prison and he was gonna be in there for a long time that she finally felt safe enough to come forward about her story and tell police. And this had been such a mental prison for this woman for, for years because her rapist had been her local bus driver. And so every time, pretty much every time she would go to the bus station, she would have to see him there and pretend like nothing had happened because she was too scared that he would kill her. In 2019, Ian O'Callaghan was taken to court for this incident as well. And he was given a further 16 years that would run alongside his trial that he was facing for the Shirley Leach murder. Of course, that doesn't add any time to his sentence, but it was more just about this woman finally getting justice, this crime getting put on his record, because when it does finally come to the point where he will be applying for parole, 28 years into his sentence, which I think is in about 12 years now, they'll see that extra charge as well, and that'll be taken into account when they decide whether he is suitable to leave or not, which will hopefully mean that he will never leave because now there's two charges against him. I hope that makes sense. I explained that in the most confusing way possible, but that is all I have for this case. Thank you so, so much for watching. As always, if you wanna help me out on this video, make sure you leave a big thumbs up if you did enjoy it. Thanks again to Case to Five for sponsoring this video. If you wanna get 20% off of a cool new phone case, make sure you're going through my link, casetofi.com forward slash Eleanor. A huge thank you to all of my channel members for helping me decide the cases that I cover, especially my tier two members whose names are all on screen right now. If you wanna become a channel member, you can just click the join button on a desktop or there'll be a link in the description of this video. But yeah, thanks again for watching this video. If you wanna subscribe, there'll be a link right here. If you wanna subscribe to my second channel, there'll be a link right here. And if you wanna watch another video, there'll be a playlist on screen right now. Bye.